Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend Steve, although these days I go by May Lynn. I am a trans woman. If you have a problem with that, you can suck it. It's episode 434 of the podcast. Yes, yes, Little Lebowski Urban Achievers, and proud we are of all of that. We've got some news to do in the opening. We've got a really good Steve Sistoric approximations coming up after that. We will be talking about uh, a folk singer who defines the word ally. Very excited about it. And okay. our movie this and our movie this week is COVID-19 Invasion, starring yes. quotes, starring Kevin Nash. Um wow, what a big piece of shit. I don't want to get too into it, but holy crap. Yes. This holy was crap. a huge piece of shit. This was bad. You know how bad it was? Uh it, I've never seen a movie right before the end credits apologize. <laughs> Right before the credits, <laughs> to have just a just a statement going, yeah, we know, yeah, sorry, it it wow, uh, it, but anyway, uh, buddy, yes, we're currently recording the podcast every other week because it helps me with it, my anxiety and my stress to not have to do the show every week. Plus, I have had. A crazy ass year so far, but I, that's beside the point. But the problem, the problem with doing the podcast every other week is that a lot of nuggets of news fall through the cracks. But never fear, my friend, because the Pope on Film podcast is here to give you uh, an educational news facial with a little bit that we like to call the Pope on Film news smatterings. It, it's not the best name for a segment, no. but I still like it. I still think it's cute. The Pope on Film News Smatterings. I like it. First off, Kevin Smith released a trailer for Clerks 3. Did you see this, Bunny? Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. Clerks, Clerks 3, the making of Clerks 1. Basically. basically, like uh, he's making the first film exist in the third film. Yes. Which is about as annoyingly meta as you can get. Not surprising coming from Kevin Smith. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Bunny? Uh, I, I'm just generally disappointed in Kevin Smith and I really didn't want that to happen. You know, I was even willing to like overlook yoga hosers, uh. you know, but like you can really only just push me so far. Right. You know, I mean, like, yeah, the Jay and Silent Bob reboot was kind of. Eh, you know, I never and, bothered to see that. See, I think that proves my point right there. Yeah. And, I, and I, now I, and now this. Which. Yeah, I'll probably watch yeah. it and I'll probably hate it. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin Smith, though. Kevin Smith. And also, here's here's another thing that happened since the last time we recorded an episode. Howie Mandel showed a graphic prolapsed anus on his TikTok. Okay. This happened. This was a thing. This is fact. Howie Mandel, it was like midnight or 1 a.m. What was it like a week ago, Amber? 
And I don't know, maybe he was on some medication or something, but he always posts weird shit on TikTok. See, I don't know TikTok. And he just posted uh, a picture of a person's, a gross graphic close-up picture of someone's prolapsed anus. And this is a sign of a good, this is a sign of a good movie, like this week's movie, when there's a fart joke three minutes into the film. Yes. And here's, here's how you can tell you're listening to a good podcast when the words prolapsed anus shows up 10 minutes in. Yes. That's a sign of a good podcast right there. You know, when Jeannie, you hear Jeannie, prolapsed. Jeannie does want to know, and I think it's an important question to ask before we get too far afield here. Was it his anus? He said that it was a friend's. What did he specifically say, Amber? A very good friend, I would imagine. Apparently. I can't really remember, but he was like, um, I'm asking, like, basically asking for a friend. This happened to my friend. Um, he's like, maybe it's a symptom of COVID. Uh, like, what do you guys think it is and whatnot? And it was up for hours, and everyone was like, did I really just see that? And it didn't get taken down for, like, hours. Yeah, it's fascinating the way that, you know, TikTok works that like, whoa, you showed a nipple. We got to take this down immediately. But Howie Mandel shows a prolapsed anus and it gets to stay up for hours. This happened. Well, it's weird. I still haven't gotten any sort of answer as to how it happened or why. I mean, we did. We did live through Goatsy. Yeah. So exactly how traumatic. Yeah. I mean, I understand for the kids today, this being shocking, but, you know, yeah. back in the wild west days of the internet where we had Goatsy and we had Tub Girl, come on. What is this? It's this, you know, this is nothing. It, and it, the thing that shocked me is that it was Howie Mandel notorious germaphobe howie mandel yes you would you would think that like notorious germaphobe and prolapsed anus would not be on the same page but apparently no. i i'd be wrong i assumed i assumed when howie mandel did this that howie mandel for lack of a better explanation that howie mandel was going through a paula abdul okay he's He's like on two different TV shows. He's working on comedy. He's working on producing a movie. He's working on this. He's working on that. He's working on a book. He's got a wife. He has kids he never sees. And he's just so completely burned out that like he's on TikTok at 1 a.m. showing prolapsed anuses. You know, I, I still find it amazing that. In the year 2022. We still know the name Howie Mandel. I don't think that's right. Well, he's like a... Yeah, I know, but he should have gone the way like of Sinbad. Now. Yeah. Yeah, a Amber just said that her generation knows Howie Mandel as, uh, like, uh, America's Got Talent and as a TV show host, and that's it. Yeah. I I still know Howie Mandel as the comedian that would put a condom over his head. Yes. That's how I know Howie Mandel. Yes. In Bobby's world. St. Elsewhere was the one where the whole thing was just a figment of a of an autistic kid's imagination. Am, am, am I right? In as that? it as it turned out, yes. Yes. Okay. The St. Yeah, Elsewhere oh, Hospital. Yes, the St. Elsewhere Hospital turned out to actually be a hospital in a snow globe yeah that this autistic child had yeah and that's why every time i see an autistic child i say thanks for saying elsewhere yeah you know i, I so, say put him in charge of programming right uh so 
In other news, my car is dead, and we're working on fixing it. So I haven't gone to too many movies. I kind of miss going to the movies. Yeah. Uh, once or twice a week, but I did go and see Thor Four: The Foreigning. We are going like right after this. Yeah. Okay. Um. So keep your yap shut. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of spoilers for Thor 4. Number one, Icarus kills Ajax. What was that? Icarus kills Ajax. Oh, well, thank God for that. My new thing now is whenever a Marvel movie comes out, doing spoilers for the Marvel movies that came right before it. So, like, I'm saying eternal spoilers, like anyone cares. Yeah. Uh, Thor 4 spoiler, you're not going to believe this. Jim from The Office is Reed Richards. Yes. Uh, spoiler alert. And really alert. wasn't very effective at all. Yeah. Sp- here's a spoiler alert for Thor 4. Uh, there are three different Spider-Men in one movie. Yes. What? So, uh... Uh, Thor 4. See, you're, you're about to go see the movie, so I don't want to say too much. I'll say this. This is not a spoiler. It, it, it in no way is a part of the plot at all. Thor's roommate is in this. Well... Thor's roommate Daryl is in Thor Four. Oh. Remember those mini movies? Yes, <laughs> that they did. Yeah. Well, now in New Asgard, which is in like whatever small country in the middle of nowhere, now Daryl is like a tour guide working with the city of Thor. Did his former roommate good? Is what I'm saying. Well, that's it... nice. It's in no way a part of the plot, but I noticed, I'm like, hey, that guy kind of looks like his roommate, huh? And then I noticed the name tag said, hello, my name is Daryl, and I'm like, yes! That means all of that weirdo shit was canon. That Daryl needed a roommate, and Thor became his roommate for two movies, and then Daryl moved to L.A., and his roommate was uh, the guy from um, the, the Grandmaster. The Grandmaster, yes. So all of that's canon now, which also means that Steve Rogers killed a prisoner and promised Thor that he wouldn't tell anybody about it. That was it. That was a small... Anyway, that's, that's uh, my favorite part of Thor 4 is the fact that Daryl is in it and has like three or four lines. It made me happy. But it's... It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's a Marvel movie. It's fine. I'm a little bit upset because before Thor uh, Love and Thunder came out, There was a lot of promises about like, oh, yes, LGBT representation. Yes, Valkyrie, you will know her uh, sexuality and it's at the forefront. And then I see the movie and it's like, wait, that was it. That was nothing. We were promised more and just it it upset me. It upset me a little bit. But uh, let's let's move on from that. It's been another bad couple of weeks for Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Oh, good. What's happening to him now? Uh, there were three more secret hush money payments to people that he uh, sexually harassed and had sexual relationships with. Uh, including one former wrestler, one former female wrestler in 2005. There's a list of people it could be. It could be Molly Holly. It could be uh, Nydia. It could be uh, something Marie. I don't remember her name. There's a list, but 
I think uh, I'm it's going. Kind of, I'm going with Nidia right there. I'm going with Nidia. Nidia. Uh, so, uh, the good news is, is that yeah, Vince McMahon, he's a horrible person, and he's done horrible things, and somewhere along the line. Vince McMahon, uh, good friends with Donald Trump. His it, Vince McMahon's wife was a member of his administration. Yes. Vince McMahon, real piece of shit. <laughs> uh, his his career is going down the toilet, and it couldn't have happened to a more deserving person. But at some point in time, Vince McMahon just, I guess he just thought that he was the wwe you know yeah vince mcmahon just he thinks he's it and uh he's going down and i'm really happy about that is how wrong is he really though i don't know i I mean he took his dad's relatively small company and made it a worldwide thing. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. I... Whereas uh, WCW... He's a scumbag, got... but he kind of has a point there. Yeah. Uh, whereas WCW, uh, they got their money from uh, Ted Turner, and this is how Ted Turner got his money. I'm not sure if a lot of people know this, but he was accidentally sewn into the pants of the big Charlie Brown at the Thanksgiving parade. Yes. And so he made all of his money off the big Charlie Brown. And that's why to this day, Ted Turner hates bald boys. Yes. He despises bald boys. In fact, when Ted Turner sees a bald boy, he thinks he's back in the pants. Yes. But, uh, (laughs) Uh, Netflix was working on this big, uh, glossy documentary of the life of Vince McMahon. I'm happy to say it's been canceled. Okay. So Good. Netflix, Netflix, uh, has its issues, but it gave, I think you could leave with Tim Robinson a third season. It canceled Bright 2, and it stopped work on the Vince McMahon documentary. So, uh, good for you. Good for you, Netflix. Yes. It, it, yes, you do have a lot of transphobic comedians, but you did say fuck off to Vince McMahon, so it really is a give and a take, you know? Yes. Uh, yes, Netflix gives a platform to transphobic comedians who make my life as a trans woman a living hell, but I am getting a third season of Tim Robinson, so, you know, you take the good... You take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. Uh, it, the crazy thing is, is that Vince McMahon... Okay, but wait, these- wait, wait, wait. See, let, let's not go past Netflix too quick, okay? Yes. Because Netflix is kind of emblematic and representative of my life. Okay. Okay? So, like, in the 80s, I get really into comic books, and I feel like, wow, look at this really cool thing that I found and discovered, only to find out later that it was the decade where everyone in the fucking world got into comic books, and there was nothing unique about me in my find whatsoever. Hmm. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, And frankly, I've also come to a conclusion that we could pretty much discount any knowledge I have about comic books because they're all shit that I read like almost 40 fucking years ago. Like forever ago. You know, so yeah. what does that matter anymore? Yeah. Come into the 90s, really get into wrestling. And here is this thing. Here's something I found. Here's something I like. Here's something like, you know, almost feels like something underground in the decade where everyone, everyone was watching wrestling. Every fucking person watching wrestling 
again, like comics, nothing new, nothing unique, nothing. So Netflix start having a problem with Netflix, but I keep the subscription, keep the subscription, never watch Netflix. Like, okay, this is it. This is finally it. I'm pulling the trigger. I'm canceling Netflix. Yeah. How did that work out for you? Then everybody in the fucking world cancels goddamn Netflix. Yeah. Maybe I'm looking at this all wrong. Maybe I'm just that goddamn cool. Maybe. Where You're everyone a needs to follow what I'm doing. Yeah. You're a trendsetter. Yes. You're ahead of the curve. That might be... No, I think... Like, no, see, I think I, I, I just am the curve. You're really gleaming the cube. Yes. As, as the young people say. You know who else has been having a wonderfully horrible time who also deserves all of the horrible things that happened to him? Yes, I am talking about Elon Musk. Yes. His, uh, his life seems to be deteriorating as well. His Twitter deal fell through. Uh, uh, Trump recently turned on him, which I'm really excited about. So the right is torn. <laughs> uh, plus, he had secret twins. This came out uh, this week that he had uh, twins with uh, a woman who worked for him. And uh, those twins uh, came out, were birthed just a few weeks before he gave birth with his girlfriend gave birth. Okay. So Elon Musk is just having sex left and right. Plus, and this is true, I learned this like two days ago, scribbled it into the margins here on the new smatterings. Elon Musk has a dad. His name is Errol Musk. Yes. His dad has had two kids with his stepdaughter. Yes. Which I'm not too good when it comes to like uh family tree math, but I believe that means that Elon Musk's brothers were birthed by his sister. Yes. I got that right? Yes. Uh Okay. Yes. Okay. There you go. Hooray! Elon Musk's life is falling apart. Oh, how interesting that right before Elon Musk's life fell apart, he took a sharp turn to the right. Gee! It's almost as if a lot of problematic people have a habit of doing that right before horrible things come to light. Like, like every time, like if suddenly uh, Oprah Winfrey came out and said, look, the media has gone too far demonizing people. So sick of the media. Donald Trump was right. The media is a bunch of fake news and a bunch of liars always saying horrible things about people and what they definitely didn't do with a donkey. It's like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to assume some shit's about to go down in the Oprah Winfrey universe. Yes. If she said that. <clears throat> so it, basically, that's what Elon Musk has had before his life started uh, being ruined. I've become obsessed with this game, uh, with this video game called Fall Guys. Uh, it's been out for a really long time, which is, And the fact that I'm into it doesn't say anything for the game's popularity. I don't play a lot of video games. Usually when I get into something, uh, that's usually a sign that it's about to die. But I'm I'm obsessed with this game called Fall Guys. The way that I explained it to my wife is that basically imagine a battle royale, but a cutesy Japanese Hello Kitty Battle Royale for children, and that's this game. It's really kind of cool, and I love it. The kids are playing it right now in front of me as I do the podcast, and I'm... uh, 
who's playing right now? Is that you, Jaden? You're doing great. You're almost finished with this round. You're doing wonderful. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Elon Musk. Fuck him. Yeah. Uh, uh, another bit of news. Mark Cuban. Rich guy. Yes. Uh, but here's the thing. Like I like I I was talking to uh, my son Mal about Mar about a rich like billionaire Mark Cuban, and Mal said, "Who's Mark Cuban?" And I said, "The fact that you can even say that should tell you that he's not problematic." Yes, because if you know an ultra rich person's name off the top of your head, it's usually not for a good reason. Yes, this is true. You know, you can you can name all of these rich people because they're horrible. But the fact that I mentioned Mark Cuban to people and both uh, Mal and my wife go, wait, who? It's like, OK, you, you know, that's good. I, so Mark- I only know him for him having been the rich guy to get on television to criticize Trump. and then having go to go backwards to find out has something to do with some stupid ass show called Shark Tank. Yeah, Sharky Shark Tanky Tank. And that is that is the extent of my knowledge of Mark Cuban. Uh he has a whole lot of money, so I still don't fucking like him. He he every once in a while he'll get a bug up his butt to try and shake up an industry like there was some talk about him trying to shake up the movie theater business like a decade ago and he had all these plans uh he had all of these plans for all of these things that he wanted to do uh for movie theaters and he owns a sports team and and he does it, every once in a while, he tries to upset a business. And what he's doing right now is he started a new uh, service called Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drug Company. And it's a, minute warning. a oh, OK, it's a m- mail to you subscription service. He makes the drugs himself, you know, his people. And he makes them at a cheaper cost and he marks them up 15% from its making price. And then he sends them to you and you pay $5 shipping. And I'm on it. I'm on a estrogen and a testosterone blocker. Now I am on H HRT is what they call it. Hormone replacement therapy. Okay. And the, the pills that I take are really expensive. But Mark Cuban has a service now where where you sign up with him, you go through him, you get your prescription sent to him, and the prices are remarkably cheap. Remarkably cheap. If there's a medication out there and you can't afford it, you should go and check out Cost Plus Drug Company because he's specifically in business, in the prescription drug business for one reason, and that's to piss off actual prescription drug people. And it's just some rich dude who's decided to try and piss off an entire industry. But this industry deserves it. And now I have my next um, uh, meeting about my HRT is in September. And when that happens, we're going to get my prescriptions moved from CVS, where I'm paying like $90 every three months to I'll be paying about. 30 bucks through yeah. our Cuban service. And it's really great. And I, it, it, I, it, it's not making a lot of news right now, but the cost plus drug company, cheap medication. If there's a medication out there, you, you can't really afford it. Uh, Mark Cuban might have you covered, which is, which is really interesting, but yeah, Mark Cuban cost plus drug company want to get the word out there it, it, it's uh really good stuff and it's inexpensive do you have any news money that has happened between our last episode and this episode that you'd like to shoehorn in here 
Oh. The Thor mid credit sequence got me super excited. Really? I will say that. Yes, okay. I got super excited. As a comic book fan, I got super excited. If I was just a person who was watching these movies, I'd be really confused by the mid credit sequence. But you and I, Bonnie, see the mid credit sequence and we go, hell yes. Okay. I am excited for this. Yes. As comic book fans. Really great. And keep an eye out for Daryl. Really excited that Daryl's in this. I mean, so many, so many horrible, horrible, horrible things happen in a two-week span. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of hard to keep track of them all. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's nice to see Biden and the Saudi prince be bestie buds now. You know, but at the same time, the right was like, oh, this will certainly ha being nice to this Saudi, this murderous Saudi prince. Oh, this will haunt Biden. Don't y'all remember when Trump and the other Saudis took a picture in front of the evil gigantic orb from Dr. Doom's lair? Yes. Like the freaking like like Donald Trump just went to a Legion of Doom headquarters meeting. Yeah, exactly. It's like fucking ridiculous. And it's like, yeah, it, what this proves is that American presidents are beholden to rich Saudi leaders. It doesn't I, I don't think it, it it says bad about Biden, but it says bad about every freaking president, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I, I am sorry. I, I hold all politicians responsible at this point. Yep. You know, as if you're a career politician, you've been doing this your whole life. You've been in government for decades. It's your shit ass leadership that's brought us to the edge of fascism. Yes, I don't care who the fuck you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's basically been this week it's been horrible uh trans people are still the the absolute they're responsible for everything they're they're the scapegoat of the world right now so hooray i picked a great time to realize i'm trans yeah right not not winning any popularity contests but um Hey, and also for those of you who are listening, uh, I, I I am a a trans woman. I do have a female voice. I just don't like using it for this podcast. This is my regular voice. If I'm at a store and I have to talk to a cashier or tell a Karen to please move out of my way because white people tend to take a whole aisle and not care anyway, uh, I do have a female voice that I use. I'm just not using it in this episode. But won't really that also come with the estrogen treatment? Not, not really. I don't think it'll be softening my voice. My wife says that my face is more defined in a way that it hasn't been before. I'm not entirely sure about that. And I can't show you, but uh, my breasts are taking shape. They're not growing yet, but they're taking shape. Okay. Is what uh, both uh, Natasha and Emerald have said. Yeah. So, yay. I, I am just letting you know ahead of time, I am not going to notice. Because you are... Flurry. Yeah. <laughs> so... And you've always been that big and blurry. That's a good point. So I, I, I couldn't even really tell if you were wearing a dress or not at any given point. I'm wearing so, leggings. So your, your face becoming more defined? Yeah, no way in hell I'm going to notice that shit. I'm just letting you know ahead of time. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. 
So that's it for the Pope on Film News Smatterings. That's it for uh, our monologue. We will be moving on to Steve's historical approximations now. I'm very excited about this one. We might not even do running out the clock. We probably will. Good job, Jaden, getting to the finale. I believe in you. But uh, this is a really good one. We're going to be talking about uh, pride and gay rights and Bob Dylan, and the song The House of the Rising Sun. And we're going to be talking about a, a, the word ally and what that means. Okay. That's what we're going to be talking about. I will try not to get too upset, but we're going to be talking about allies and what that means and the absolute pinnacle, the greatest ally in the history of, of, of the word pride. I'm very excited about this uh, this chap. It's going to be really, really good. So uh, we do this through Zoom, and so we're going to get cut off in a second. In about a, a minute, Jaden has made it to the finale. Uh, uh, he's getting caught up. He's getting caught up in the hammers. I believe in you, Jaden. Oh. Oh, has round made it over. To the Jaden finale. made it. Uh, it, it, the game Fall Guys, it starts off with 60 different people and it's 60 actual people that you're playing against and you keep going in these rounds where a certain amount of people are eliminated until you get to the final round where it's just you and like eight other people and you're still playing and, and, and only one person wins. I have gotten to the finale three times but I've never won a game. Jaden just got to the finale and he didn't win. It's fun. It, it uh, Fall Guys reminds me of like Wii Sports, like Wii games, where like you and your mom and your grandmother could pick up a controller and play. And yeah. I haven't felt this way about a video game in a while, but it's really simple and easy, stupid game that like anybody can play and have fun. And yeah, I dig this game. Yeah, it's, really fun. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, so that's it for our monologue. Uh, there's going to be a, a little break and while I log back on to Zoom and stay tuned for Steve.
And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Funny! Yes? If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's uh, the talk of the town, sweeping the nation. America's craving some Pope on Film. Here you go. But, uh... Ah! Lower that. That was scary. It was bunnyception. But only the real fans, the true hardcore fans of this podcast, who have been with us since the beginning, back in 2011, when we started as a knitting podcast. You remember that, Bunny? Yes. We were I one still of the don't first understand podcasts. Pearl 2, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we actually recorded 600 episodes just about knitting before we moved into talking about movies there just seemed to be more to talk about with movies well there there was an, a brief stint of being an exclusive chris gaines podcast yes, yes. i his, his music is still amazing rip chris gaines rip but only the real fans of this podcast who've been with us since the beginning only the real fans would know two facts about the both of us, two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and Mei Lin. The first fact about you, Bunny, is that when you are not doing the podcast, and I don't think a lot of people know this, but when you're not doing the podcast, you are a renegade street artist. So tell us, Bunny, Yes. What yeah. makes your renegade street artwork stand out from everyone else? Well, I use a, a very uh, high grade textured polymer that you can really only get through special order. Mm -hmm. And I go through the city, and when I find a place that inspires me i use the polymer to sculpt it into what looks like gum hmm so on a on a particular spot of the sidewalk might be me a, a sculpture of gum and what's funny is people think it's real gum that's yes. the fun because it is just that authentic looking. You know, you see like a lot of under you under see a, a lot of under a railing yeah. might sculpt a, a bit of gum. So it's very it's very uh it's very controversial. Uh, Banksy has has come out to me personally to tell me how much he admires my work. Uh, in in O oh, gum. Uh, Banksy came up to me. True story. Tears, tears in his eyes. He yes. came up to me. He said, "Sir, that's what Trump says about everyone." Yes. Bunny's work is currently on display. You can see Bunny's work. Uh, a real, uh, uh, a lu lucrative deal that Bunny signed to showcase his artwork under tables at your local McDonald's. Yes. Yes. So it, just go to your McDonald's, look under the table. What do you see stuck to the table? Bunny's art. Yeah. Bunny's art. You're yeah. welcome. And it's exclusively, exclusively McDonald's. So if you go to Burger King, and you see the same thing under that? No, that's, that's somebody real else. gum. That's fucking disgusting. Yeah, that's gross. That this is, is gross. high art faux gum. It's art. It's art. People yes. just don't get that. It's art. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a, a storyteller. So what I like to do in this uh, corner of the podcast... <laughs> is I like to take a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know that well, and reword it via my own unique razzmatazz. So that's what this is. 
another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Dun, 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 dun. Or Shep, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Now, personally, I like the name Shep. It's short and direct and to the point, which is kind of like this podcast, except for the short part or the direct part or the whole to the point part. But that's beside the point. And also, it has to continue being Steve's historic approximations. It can't be May Lynn's historic approximations. What's it going to be? Mulhap? That sounds crazy. That's nonsense words. Now, Shap, that sounds like something. That sounds like the noise Indiana Jones whip makes. Shap, that's what it sounds like. It sounds strong. Anywho. Yes, it does. This week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be discussing the 100% true story of the New York City folk singer who absolutely, positively earned the title of ally. And yeah, uh, maybe this chap uh, would have been better placed in June, which is Pride Month. But look, them, them's the breaks. And, and while we're on the subject of allies, um, every, I am a trans woman. I... I There were a million clues that I was a a woman that were hidden throughout my entire life. And I didn't realize them until my daughter, Amber, finally just asked me point blank when I dress up, do I feel like a man who is dressed as a woman or do I feel like a woman? And at that point, a light bulb went over my head and I realized that I was a woman and I saw all of the million clues the million clues that I had ignored throughout my entire life. And now I I am trans and I'm happy about being trans and I'm proud about being trans, but it it is difficult to wake up every morning and to see even more people who want me dead. Yes. It's tough. It's tough. And there are a lot of people out there. A lot of people that say, I am an ally, I am an ally for 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 trans people. But uh, it really is time for action because trans people, they're being targeted. They're being picked on. They're being beaten. They're being murdered. It, it, it really is time to speak up. It's time to shit or get off the pot in the in the in terms of the word ally we need your help we need you to stand up we need you to be a voice for us and say uh hey if you and if if you're listening to this podcast on i don't know uh, itunes spotify stitcher uh if you're watching this on itunes or or youtube or whatever and you don't know a trans person Hi, my name is Maylin. I'm trans. I'll be your one trans friend so that now you can go around to all of the people you know and say, hey, trans people aren't bad. I know a trans person. And you know what? They're pretty cool. They're a pretty good guy. Well, as of right now. Pretty good girl. Yeah. Eleanor has decided that when they grow up, they want to be a trans woman. Uh, Okay. So Eleanor has decided that when she grows up, She's going to be a trans woman. Yes. I tried to explain to her how that doesn't work, but she's insistent in saying, you can't stop me. Okay, so this is this is a weird, this is a weird way to look at things. Eleanor, a naturally born woman, wants to grow up and be a trans woman. That's some straight up Victor Victoria shit. Yes. Wow! Victor Victoria! Yes. I haven't seen that since uh, since uh, 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 <coughs> Hanoi Jane was doing workout videos. And something unusually I found out recently mm-hmm. Julie Andrews is still alive. Yeah, she she's 
She's the voice of Gru's mom in the Despicable Me universe. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's been in like two or three Minions movies. It's it's weird. And to the best of my knowledge, Wilfred Brimley is still alive, too. I think he's dead. I'm not sure. I think he's dead. Yeah? I'm not sure. I feel bad not knowing. Okay, so allies. Yes. The ally at the center of this chap is a folk singer named Dave Van Ronk. And some people out there who are watching this live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Pope on film, or maybe they're listening to it on their favorite uh, podcasting device like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher. Uh, or maybe uh, you're watching this on YouTube. You might already know the story of Dave Van Ronk. In in uh, LGBTQ plus circles, this story is uh, semi-famous, but a lot of straights do not know the story of Dave Van Ronk, and that's the whole point of Shaft, to open people's freaking minds. Yes, honey? Wilford Brimley died August 1st, 2020. Wilford Brimley died August 1st, 2020. Ah, uh, okay. And they that's fascinating because he made Cocoon in the mid 80s and he's already looked at death's door then. Yes, yes, he did. So he lasted he lasted past Cocoon and into COVID. I mean, wow, no, barely, barely. Yeah, yeah. just barely, <laughs> just barely. Way to go. Couldn't hang, buddy. Couldn't hang with the rest of us. <laughs> Eleanor, you're going to be a trans woman when you grow up. I believe in you. So it's the 1950s and 60s in New York City, and Dave Van Ronk is being hailed as the king of McDougal Street. Okay. And for all of you squares out there in Squaresville, oh, uh, McDougal Street is a one-way street in Greenwich Village that was basically kind of sort of the center of cool bohemian life. Uh, Bob Dylan had an apartment there uh, above the clubs and the bars and the cafes where Miles Davis would hang out, Gore Vidal, Willie S. Burroughs, Jackie Kerouac, Brando, Allen Ginsberg, Jack London, Simon, Theodore, Alvin, all of the cool people of the day. Yes. Gidget, all of the cool people, you know? They would drink coffee and smoke, and I assume they did cool things like sing numbers from the musical 42nd Street. I don't know what cool people were doing back then. Uh, The Charleston. Yes. Anywho, McDougal Street was the cool place to be. Bob Dylan's first concert was there. Hendrix did a bunch of early concerts there. It was the center of cool in New York City. Like uh, if Soho was a small street where people didn't bathe. And, uh, and on that street, McDougal Street uh, and Greenwich Village in general, uh, Dave Van Ronk Poet and folk musician Dave Van Ronk was the king of McDougal Street. He was the king. He was the guy who knew everyone, who held court, and who ended up helping a lot of up-and-coming artists out. Uh, Hey, Bob Dylan, maybe smoke some weed or sing about it or whatever. Hey, Joni Mitchell, do you want to play the circle game before you take a big yellow taxi to Woodstock? That's Three Joni Mitchell references in one sentence, and I'm yes. pretty proud of that. Uh, hey, British band The Animals, have you heard my own unique arrangement of their traditional folk song, The Rising Sun Blues? Maybe you could steal my arrangement and become a famous band. That's right! <laughs> their version of House of the Rising Sun was them saying, Hey, let's just do it the way Dave Van Ronk does it in a small coffee shop on McDougal Street. And then that became like one of the greatest songs in the world. Well, they, I, I yeah. had 
Dave and I wrong. had heard recently that nobody really knows what the origin of the House of the Rising Sun is and seems to date back to at least 20, uh, 1929. Yeah. Yeah, the song. But nobody sort of... is exactly sure yep. where this song came from, or who its original writer was, or anything like that. Which can only mean one thing: the song came from the future, and someone went back in time and placed it there. Yes. The only logical, only logical explanation. It'll be Marty uh, McFly in the remakes. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the animals! It's your cousin! Your cousin, Marvin the Animals? Yeah. You know that new song you've been looking for? Well, listen to this! You can do that with anything. That's going to be my new thing. Uh, so this guy, Dave Van Ronk, he legitimately helped uh, give birth to folk music and folk rock. And he, he was the king of McDougal Street. He released well over 30 albums in his lifetime. And although none of them were smash hits, although he, he never became a worldwide celebrity, his behind-the-scenes contributions to American music is absolutely on unparalleled. And also, for reasons that will be important later, I need to mention, he was a straight white man. Okay. He was a straight, white, cishet male. This is an important part of the story. He was some white dude playing... He was some straight white dude getting poontang on McDougal Street playing folk music with Bob Dylan. He was in no way gay or trans or bi or a part of the LGBTQIAA plus rainbow. He was just a cishet straight white dude. That That is important. So, okay. Put a pin on that. Let's put a pin on the story of DVR because we're leaving McDougal Street and heading to Houston Street and then taking that to the Avenue Houston. of the Americas. Huh? Don't, don't make me fuck you up on this point. It what? is Houston Street. Uh, <laughs> Houston Street. Okay. So we're leaving McDougal Street. We're heading to Houston Street and taking that to the Avenue of the Americas past Minetta Playground, taking that to Waverly Place, and then bada-bing, bada-boom, a seven-minute walk later, which isn't that far, seven minutes, not that far, we are at the Stonewall Inn. Now, I don't have time to go into massive detail about the Stonewall riot, so this will really be uh, the Cliff Notes Guide to the Stonewall Riots. Okay. This isn't the history, the complete history of the Stonewall Riots. This is more like uh, uh, a sober, drunk history version of okay. the, the story of the Stonewall Riots. So in the 50s and in the 60s, Life was hard for LGBT people. Gay and lesbians uh, weren't fully considered citizens. They didn't have full rights. They didn't have equal rights. They weren't allowed in government at all because they were considered perverted and thus susceptible to blackmail. Yes. To be fair, you can. It's not like straight people are unblackmailable. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. That's fine. Well, well, uh, well, I no, I just always kind of loved that concept and that idea that we will repress certain people so that they must hide 
and because that they are basically hiding, they can't have any kind of authority because they're susceptible to blackmail for the closet we've shoved them into. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, it, yeah. It, if it didn't have to be hidden, it's not something that you can blackmail somebody about. Yeah. Uh, and. Okay. So, nobody can nobody can blackmail you for being a trans woman. No, no, no. That's the thing is they don't want it to get out that they're fucking those trans women. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. It's not about the trans women because you can't blackmail trans women if she's out and open about it. Exactly. You can't be like, exactly. I'm going to tell your secret. Well, the whole fucking world knows. How about I tell your secret that you went down on me last night? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's yeah. the that's the point right there that I'm saying anyway. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the reasons why when I realized that I was trans, I'm just gonna be just out in the open about this. This isn't gonna be something that I'm gonna hide that's gonna come and bite me in the ass later. It, it's very difficult to be a trans woman and to be out in the open about it. And I've heard from a lot of other uh trans people that 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 sp- spend almost the entirety of their lives in a closet but still consider themselves trans people but they're scared or they're afraid or they can't come out and it's really difficult to be out there it's gotten pretty common to have people attack me on on social media which isn't fun but it's a small price to pay to try and be out in the open like when david letterman was having sex with with another woman and he and s- someone said dave i know about you uh cheating on your wife so pay me ten thousand dollars or i'll tell everyone so david letterman opened up his show by telling everyone that he was having sex with another woman yeah yeah like damn david letterman way to control the narrative You can't blackmail someone who is just out about everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it was a very difficult time to be gay in America. The police and the FBI would keep lists of gay people. And when I heard that, I was like, that's shocking. But then I thought, "Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if I'm on some lists myself right now, you know? And oh, that wouldn't okay. surprise yeah. me. You, you, you might have picked up some lists, but we have always been on lists. Yeah. There is Especially not with a this time podcast. we have not been on lists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you what just else? picked the up Americans, a few more. Yeah. The American Psychological Association, Association listed homosexuality as a mental disorder. Uh, in Cuba, they had prison work camps just for gay people they were basically gay concentration camps you don't hear people teaching about that why would they that's a that's a that would be considered a a a piece of trans history not a piece of uh, humans history it's messed up that that happens but but it's it's not known it's not talked about that it happened would have to mean that they would acknowledge trans people's existence. Yeah. And gay people's existence. Yeah. And and you'll and make s- and you'll make little white children feel bad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And cities cities would perform sweeps where violent cops would perform violent raids on neighborhoods to try and rid them of gays and lesbians and trans people. And so it's 1969 and the ACAB police are doing a raid of Greenwich Village. This is how back in the day, the police would get away with being really violent and arresting all of these gay and trans people is that, hey, we are a, a, a club and we would like to have a liquor license. Okay, here is your liquor license. Wait. Is this a club for gay people? You can't have a liquor license because gay people are evil. And if you drank, that would just be more evil. So no gay clubs are allowed to have alcohol. So if, if you go to a gay club, 
a, a lot of these gay clubs would essentially become sort of like speakeasies, you know, where gay people would hang out and, hey, maybe we'll have a drink. And then the police would raid it saying, where's your liquor license? And also a lot of times, a lot of straight people don't want to be in the business of owning a place where gay people can hang out. So a lot of times the mafia would be like, okay, I know that we're horrible and we're killing people, but fuck it. If the gays want to have this building, have this building. This can be your club. And so the police would then say, oh, here's a place where gay people are hanging out. They might be drinking alcohol in there. And also, the mafia probably owns this place. Let's go in with our bats and just start beating the shit out of gays. Yeah. So, it's 1969, and the police are doing a raid of Greenwich Village. They're going into gay and lesbian bars, and they're swinging their batons and bashing in heads and breaking shit. And they go to the Stonewall Inn at 1.20 a.m. on Saturday, June 28th, 1969. And what would normally happen was that the police would, would go in there, they'd, they'd bust some heads, they'd, then they would line everyone up that was in the club. And then they would uh, take a peek and verify your gender, with finger quotes, and if anyone who happened to have a penis was dressed as a woman, they would be arrested. And uh, a lot of times, I really looked into this, a lot of times why the police would do this is because it helped their arrest numbers. Yeah. So, like, you are not that great of a policeman, and you don't do a lot of work, and you haven't arrested that many people. So, okay, then just go to a gay club and start arresting people, because they never fight back. And since gays never fight back, just go and arrest some people. Say, hey, here's this gay person who's doing a gay thing. And I arrested this other gay person and this other gay person. And these two women were kissing. There you go. My arrest numbers are better. I'm going to go eat some freaking donuts now. So, um, so the police go to the Stonewall Inn. They're busting heads, breaking glass. And uh, that night, the trans people... The trans people of color, which is defined, to be clear, a trans person of color is defined as any trans person who's not white. So FYI, I, I am a trans person of color, and that's awesome. And uh, I've got it. I've got it. So the trans people and the trans people of color at the Stonewall Inn, they had enough. They refused to line up. And pretty soon, bricks and bottles started flying all over the place. This was the beginning of the gay pride movement. In fact, the first ever pride march happened on the one-year anniversary of the Stonewall riot. So long story short, pride happens every year thanks to Marsha P. Johnson, the black trans woman who threw the first brick that sparked the riot. So it's upsetting in our current time to see uh, not only uh, uh, black people get attacked, but also it's upsetting to see there's a movement within the LGBT plus movement to remove the T from really? LGBT. Yeah, there's a group called the, L the LGB Alliance. Uh, we uh, lesbians and gays and bisexuals need to gather together to make sure that our rights are heard and to get rid of these groomers. And so there are even gay people who are against trans people now. Yeah. There are even trans people who are against trans people now. Thanks, Kardashians, for that one. Thanks, Kardashians. Hey, what's his name? What's, what's her name? Oh, who, who Caitlin. Was... Caitlin yeah. Jenner. Yeah, Caitlin. Okay, so two pins. One pin on the Stonewall riots and one pin on a straight cis white folksy guy, Dave Van Ronk. So let's unpin the both of those. And uh, uh, so it's early a.m. on June 28th. 10 minute morning. OK, Th that's perfect. It's early a.m. on June 28th. And the king of McDougal Street is eating at a restaurant in Greenwich Village. Right. And he's just eating. He just eating, I don't know, uh, chicken spaghetti, a chicolini. So let's say he's having a sloppy steak. 
you know, a big uh, cut of steak with water dripped all over it. it. It's so good. So Dave Van Ronk is eating a sloppy steak. He wasn't gay. He wasn't trans. He was a straight white folk singer eating at a restaurant at, you know, 1.30 a.m. on June 28th, 1969. A, a restaurant he just so happened to be eating at a restaurant that just so happened to be open very late at night and uh, at a restaurant that just so happened to be very close to a certain inn because he's eaten by the window. Suddenly he sees a commotion outside. And Dave Van Ronk says, well, gee, I guess I'll go see what all the fuss is about. So Dave Van Ronk goes outside. He sees a riot happening. He sees gay people and trans people throwing bricks at the cops. And basically, this straight white folk singer essentially goes, well, win in Rome. <laughs> and he starts throwing shit at the fucking cops. <laughs> so it, next thing you know, Dave Van Ronk is right in the middle of the Stonewall riots throwing bricks at police officers. <laughs> like, without thinking, he saw people rioting, and he said, hey, I'm not gay, I'm not a lesbian, I'm not trans, this isn't even my fight. It, you know, he, he didn't say, I'm going to go back and eat my sloppy steak. He said, no, these people are in a fight. Here, let me help. I'm going to start throwing bricks. So he, he's throwing bricks and bottles at police. He's caught by police deputy Seymour Pine. He's beaten to near unconsciousness. He's handcuffed to a hot radiator. And after the Stonewall riots finally calmed down, the police arrested 13 people. And one of those arrested at the Stonewall riots, mind you, was some straight white folk singer named Dave Van Ronk. And later, when he was questioned about the Stonewall riots, Dave Van Ronk said, anyone who would stand against the cops was all right by me. Yay! Right. Ally! That's right. what that is. That is the definition of ally, and that is what we need right now, especially trans people, non-binary people. This is dangerous for us right now. It's really difficult. It's a difficult mental place to be. To finally yes. have the, to finally reach a point where, oh my God, I've been a woman all this time and I'm taking uh, hormone replacement therapy and I'm on estrogen and I'm on a testosterone blocker and I'm working out and I'm eating regularly and I'm feeling good and I'm looking good and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm finally a woman and i'm so happy and I'm, I'm finally living my truth but also anytime i leave this house my life is in danger yes you know yes. it's a it's a difficult mental place to be to be trans right now in america because it's dangerous it is dangerous for me to simply live my authentic life and that's why everyone out there, gay, straight, we need your help to be a voice for trans people who are constantly getting attacked and marginalized. And, and, and just FYI, gay people, I'm also pansexual and uh, proud of that. And I have a pansexual flag and, and I, I, am, I am twice a member of the LGBT rainbow. But for all of those uh, people who might be gay, who might also be anti-trans, they're throwing us under the bus first. They're coming for you next. Oh, God, yes. The only way that we can defeat this uh, wave of bigotry and anti-gay uh, fascism and hatred is by banding together. You know, so it's it's important for all of us to be looking out for each other right now. But 
I love this story about Dave Van Ronk. Well, when you think of sure all the people shit arrested, nobody else is watching now for us. Yeah. You know, I there's love... not a single goddamn politician oh. that, that could give a fuck about what the people want at all. Yeah, if this was the trolley, if a politician was going through the trolley problem, the politician would have their hand on the lever, but also yelling to everybody in the path, look, you've got to vote! Yeah. Sure, I could save your lives, but, you know, this November is the most important election ever. Yes. So that's it for Steve's historical historic approximations this week. I think it's a wonderful story. The yes, story of Dave Van Ronk. I was telling uh, my wife the story of Dave Van Ronk, and halfway through the story, Mal ran out of his room, and and I'm like, what, 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 what are you doing? What happened? And Mal was just, oh, I know this story, and I'm just really excited to hear you say it. So there's a lot of people who know the story of Dave Van Ronk, but there's a lot of people who don't. Dave Van Ronk's a freaking hero. I've never heard his music, but I love this man. <laughs> so uh, Maybe we'll that's... have to find his music. Yeah, I, I, guess I think it's something to aspire to. Yeah, because he's an ally. I, I owe it to him. I'll stream him on Spotify. I, I would like to think that if I was having a sloppy steak in, in Greenwich Village, I would have done the same thing. Heck yeah. So that's it for Steve's historic approximations this week. Be sure to join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's historic approximations. And cut on that. Yes. We've still got a movie to get to. A movie starring yes with finger quotes starring kevin nash uh we're really flying blind for this week's movie covid19 invasion aka lockdown survival of the fittest because not only uh has any hardly anyone's heard of this film number one number two Hardly any YouTubers have reviewed it. Number three, hardly any podcasts have covered it. There is not a lot of information. There's no Wikipedia page for this. I, I know very little information. We're flying blind here. Yes. But thankfully, there's a lot to talk about because an angry <clears throat> Santa Claus decides to kill people by locking them in a high school. I it this is a weird film. Yes. It's a weird film we're i don't want to get too into it but we're doing an entire summer of covid movies and do you know how bad these movies are that i'm that so far the best one has been 2025 of the world enslaved by a virus yes by joshua wesley that's how bad these covid movies are yes they are horrible. Next next episode, we're doing a slasher. And, and I give I give last week's the elevator movie the second spot, but definitely twenty twenty five. Yeah, if you're if, a fan of the room, you just have to yes. watch this movie. Yeah, yeah. If you like Doug Breen, you must watch this Neil. movie. Neil Breen. Neil. What's the fucking difference? It, yeah. So so we are going to take a short break. Time for Dabney's dystopian. Oh, no, we're night. out of those. I only had three episodes. Okay. okay. So we're going to take a short break, enjoy some videos and some fun, and we will be right back with more of the Pope on Film after this. do 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 skitty papa do wow and break
On the afternoon of March 10th, 2016, an undetermined number of people, oftentimes fluctuating between 2 and 4.5 individuals, were recording a podcast on the internet. Three of them were never seen again. The next morning, the one survivor, Bunny Williams, was picked up on a roadside, blood-caked and screaming church organist. Bunny said he had the number one podcast in hell. The man babbled a mad tale, a vaguely Mexican family in the isolated state of Oklahoma, a film podcast that's only indirectly about films, a filthy podcast that somehow prominently featured young children, then Bunny fell into catatonia. Colorado lawmen mounted a five-minute manhunt but could not locate the macabre podcast. No facts, no information, no iTunes account. Officially, on the records, the Pope on film never existed. But over the years, reports of a bizarre grisly podcast have persisted all across the internet. The Pope on film has not stopped. It haunts your Facebook feed. It frightens Twitter. It vaguely jump scares Stitcher. The Pope on film seems to have no end. University, which really is as bad as pop culture has led you to believe. Yeah. And I, I went into a class and I, that I just randomly picked, and it was like a uh, American history in the 20th century, and it was just some random class I picked. And I walk into class, and it was so weird because my brother is four years older than me, so we were hardly ever in class together. We were hardly ever in the same school together. It yeah. was just the period in time where we never saw each other but i walk into class and the first person i see is my brother and we had not talked about this we just accidentally happened to take the same class together yeah and i walk into class my brother's there and he's like holy shit and i'm like holy shit and we took this class and apparently it was the teacher's first time ever teaching a class ever yeah and he had a hard time with the class and what he kept saying over and over again is look we're gonna learn a lot of things we're gonna learn a lot about american history and you're i know what you're gonna do you're gonna take this class and you're gonna do good but then you're gonna forget everything i said you're gonna forget everything i ever taught you but if you remember one thing remember this it's going to be on every test it's going to be the most important thing i'm giving you the answer right now for one question on every test you take in this class. But just remember, the most important thing you can remember is that Albert B. Fall was the Secretary of the Interior during the Harding <laughs> administration. <laughs> the infamous teapot dong scandal. And, and my brother and I looked at each other and said, okay, we're going to have to memorize this. Because apparently <laughs> this is the most important thing ever. And it gets, it, it, and that was like in 90, that was like in the year 2000. That was like 16 years ago. Yeah. And he been like a mirroring 40 and I'm living in Oklahoma and I have a wife and I have kids and I have this managerial job and every once in a while I'll do story time and I'll go kids kids we're gonna read a story it's a Dr. Seuss story you're gonna love it but first we get to that I want to talk about a character that you all love no I'm not talking about Spongebob I'm talking about Albert B. Fall you know who that is kids 
You don't? Well, he's only the Secretary of the Interior during the Harding administration who's responsible for the infamous Teapot Dome scandal. <laughs> I keep saying this one fucking... No one has any fucking idea what it means except maybe Professor Sam Schmeeding and my brother. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Steve, and today we're going to be writing songs for people, random people, at the Home Depot. Hope you like it. Check out my hair, my hair is awesome. Check out my hair, my hair is awesome. Uh. I'm showing off in a red shirt. I'm showing off in a red shirt. Check me out, I am really awesome and I'm showing off in a red shirt. Lady getting something from the trunk. No way does she have her stuff. Did she drop something? No, she's picking up trash. Picking up trash that's on the street. Picking up trash, trash lady. I want to do you all night long. I am normal, I am normal. Conform, conform. I am normal, check out my shirt. I love khaki shorts, and I'm secretly in love with my best friend and my khaki shorts. Getting in the van, getting in the van, driving away, driving away, driving away in my van. And I'd like for you to pull my red along on this that I haven't actually gotten to make a full backing track for. It's called Insect Cities, and it's about uh, someone taking their clothes off in a park and then peeling off their skin. Cool. <coughs> anyway. Okay, you got the red headed zombie crowd, you can you can handle that. Oh yeah. Or some of you are. Some of you may not be. I can't see. You took off your clothes in the middle of the grass, and like the fingers of the sun, the light held you in its grasp. You loved the wind, you mumbled on a park bench. Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit, you mumbled like a godsend, the peeling backwards of your skin, and the slow open of your ribs made the sound of soft wings and crumpled shirt sleeves. Time caps a letter held in between and dropped from hands that now know things, all now slip from memory. Scattered in the weeds grown around the family tree where the tendency runs and almost gallops, your words crashing endlessly into a cluttered pipe dream where you got your clothes because they become unclean. All this preconceived blood on your sleeve and there are needles in your fever dreams. There are fables in these secret things. Pride open how screams be strings as beauty sleeps. Petals fall as ant hills dream. Insect cities just out of reach. Put some clothes on, let's be friends. <laughs> Scared. Are you scared? I'm I'm really, really scared. Really scared. Since 1927, the American Optics Eyeglass Corporation has had one central goal to provide top class, high quality eyewear. The hot ass. Whether it's Sam Hathaway from the Princess Diaries, Rachel Lee Cook in She's All That, or Mothra in Destroy All Monsters, the American Optics Eyeglass Corporation is there to further a sexist film trope for cash. Do you know the 1957 Humphrey Bogart classic film The Big Sleep? In that film, Lauren Bacall is a nerdish bookworm with glasses. And who made those glasses? We did. The American Optics Eyeglass Corporation. You're not attractive, you wear glasses. Once the last time you heard from me, 
your sister. Have you heard from Courtney lately? I'm not gonna risk both our lives to go check on her. It's pretty harsh coming from her brother. All right, guys, listen up. We got a problem. It's the homeless. They're killing us. They're the reason why this virus keeps spreading. We're gonna take them out. What? Yeah. And I want you to join us. That's why I called you all here. I got a plan. I'm gonna do it. I'll take the lead. No, no, you're not. Dad, for once in my life, I'm not asking. I guess you're ready for war. I won't let you down. Happy? Courtney, for once in your life, just listen to me. Let's go. You're never getting out of here alive. I told you to leave my family alone. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. It's time, Bunny. It is time, sadly, sadly. It Badly. is time. Yes, Bunny, my friend, my brother, my son, third thing. It is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast, America's number one most popular film podcast hosted by a man in a top hat named Bunny. Yes. We are number one in that, in that one metric. Yes. Well, we time. also have church organist church organist yes i forgot about that it is time once again for us to do the bartman on into the second half of the show and it is said second act wherein we finally in eventually get around to discuss our all natural lemon scented non-gmo extra strength movie of the week and this week we continue our summer-long look at a new genre of film that I have dubbed covid exploitation, verbal trademark 2022, the Pope on Film and Undead Cow Studios, with a look at the hideous 2021 action film COVID-19 Invasion, a.k.a. Lockdown Survival of the Fittest. A.K.A. Is This Even a Movie? It was an hour and 24 minutes, so it was a long fucking COVID movie. It, it was an hour and 24 minute long film with about 10 minutes of plot. Yes. If that. The ninety-five percent of the film is in an abandoned high school, and I am feeling that Kevin Nash is kind of like Alice from Alice's Restaurant, because all through <laughs> the movie I kept feeling like Kevin Nash. Remember Kevin Nash star of this movie? He's starring in this movie, Kevin Nash. Remember? Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Nash. If you just saw the trailer, 
you've pretty much seen all of Kevin Nash's performance. Yes. Yes. He is barely in this. Yes. He is barely in this. Hey, but hey, look hey, at how hey. big he is on the posters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of uh it reminds me of uh 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 that that fucking Plan 9 remake. Yes. Where it's like, look who's starring in it. An actual actor. He was on WB's Charmed. Yes, this guy, he's starring in it. Okay, we're we we we've had him for a day. He's gone now, and now Mr. Lobo is shooting zombies for the ending. Yes. So the tagline bunny is if COVID doesn't kill you, they will. That's yeah. the tagline. According to IMDb. According to IMDb, this film had a budget of three million dollars. No, 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 no. I hear you there, Jeannie, with your snide little comments. I think that that budget is 100% correct. This is how I break it down. 2.5 million of that went to Kevin Nash for a half a day of work, yes. and the rest went into making the actual film. Yes. I think I've nailed the budget. <laughs> because there is no way that the actual $3 million was spent on actually making the film look good. 95% of the film is in an abandoned high school. Or be coherent. Or be coherent. Which yeah. was actually a part of the apology at the end. Yes, very much so. Okay, so before we get in, in, in too too far deep into uh, NWO's asshole, uh, so it's the summer of 2020, of, of it is the summertime in this, the year of our Lord, 2022. And every summer we here at the Pope on Film do themed summers. So we did the summer of Star Wars, which was not as fun as I had imagined it to be. People shit on Solo. That was, that was, a, that was fun. I think if it I was, was just, one of the better ones. If I was going to, just put on a Star Wars film. Just put on any Star Wars movie right now j just for something to watch. I'd probably pick Solo. I wouldn't pick Return of the Jedi or, or <laughs> The Rise of Skywalker or any of that. No, I'd probably, I'd probably put in <laughs> Solo. That was fun. The only problem uh, I had with Solo is that everything we possibly knew that happened to, to Han Solo from the original movies happened in this movie yeah so what yeah. the fuck did did han solo do with the rest of his goddamn life good question no idea no you idea. know like you kind of have to spread that shit out my favorite part of solo is when they mentioned the art of tierras kasai yeah which is a reference to one of the worst star wars video games of all time Yay! <laughs> it's canon. Okay, so so we did the summer of Star Wars where we watched all the Star Wars movies. We did the summer of Saw, which was surprisingly fun. Yes. We did the summer of Fred Willard, which was a freaking blast. And last year we did the summer of Bottoming, where we took a deep dive into IMDb's list of the 100 worst movies of all time. And now this summer we're doing the summer of COVID the it, it a whole year of covid exploitation films cheap films that were rushed into per, into production during the pandemic to cash in on the pandemic next week we're doing a covid slasher okay i it, it don't get too excited i'm i'm pretty sure it's horrible yeah i'm yeah. i'm pretty sure it's just a basically a different version of this week's film you know? Yeah. So, so uh, I, the big question this week is what the fuck is this? I, I I do not know. Okay, so like it is the year 2039 
and the world population has come down to 29 million. However, you can still apparently buy a brand new shiny truck. Yes. Because yes, Kevin Nash is driving like an all new 2025. It's Nissan Truck Month. Apparently, and in the post apocalyptic future. And your water is still running. You can still text people. And I think there is indication that there is still electricity as well. Yeah. It, what is this? A, so this is a pre-post-apocalyptic science fiction movie with no science or fiction? What, what is this film? Is it an action movie? Because there's hardly any fucking action. And is there I, a drama? Is it a drama? Because there's no stakes. I don't know what yeah. this is. And uh, apparently, Saggy Sexy is hunting down and killing anybody he thinks he has COVID. I'd hate to bring this back. I, I, I know how you feel about this show, and I hate to bring this up every episode. But this movie reminds me a lot of an action film parody from season two of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson, <laughs> where uh, Santa Claus uh, stars in the action film Detective Crashmore. That's what this felt like. I saw Kevin Nash and it was like, oh, he's Santa Claus. Just, yeah. you suck! You know, and cussing and, you know, Santa's seen all of us naked. I'm not <laughs> sure if you know that. He's seen everyone on the planet naked to make sure that you don't have tattoos. Because if you have tattoos, you get nothing for Christmas. See, now that reminded me of what I wanted to talk about earlier. Okay. See, the, you see, I, I had the realization. See, Jarvis was throughout Tony Stark's Malibu Beach House and controlled everything. Okay. Yes. And then he took on those same duties when it was moved over to Avengers Tower. Yes. Okay. Then Jarvis, along with some other fine ingredients, becomes Vision. Yes. So, to the best of our knowledge, Vision is the only Avenger who knows the penis size of all the other Avengers. Yes. He knows if, he, if they wash their hands after taking mm -hmm. a poop. Mm-hmm. You know? He knows if they actually run soap over their entire body or just yep. selected bits. Mm-hmm. Vision is the one with the real secrets. He is. To he the absolutely Avengers. is. So I don't know how we got there, but let's let's just keep going. <laughs> I still need to get I still need I still need to start Moon Knight. And then I need to get through Miss Marvel. You, uh, I'm a little you bit behind. So much. You so much have to watch Miss Marvel, but then also watch the reaction videos from Pakistani Americans reacting to Miss Marvel. It is <laughs> fucking heartwarming. Yeah, it that's is awesome. Heartwarming, like that's cool. Like they are so seeing themselves being represented in this show down to minute details that it's just it's just it makes me incredibly incredibly happy watching how happy they are that's great that's so great so it's worth it just for that yeah yeah that's cool so okay covid-19 invasion 
there's so little information about this movie. So we're really flying blind. And also, there's hardly any YouTubers reviewing this. I can only find one real review on YouTube. Uh, hardly any podcasters are, are covering this. So it really is sort of like, you know, there's no pilot on this airplane. Is this a science fiction film? Funny. Technically, yes, because it's set in the future. But. There's no reason for that. No, there's no, there's no, yeah, there, there's no reason for any of this. But I absolutely love the idea that COVID's not going away. Social distance isn't working. Let's kill the homeless people. Why? Well, okay, but, but if we drop down to a worldwide population of 29 million there are no homeless people. If That's we a, have anything was, in yeah, absolute exactly. fucking abundance, it's homes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that made no sense to me. That made absolutely no sense to me. That's, that's, that's what also bothered me in other science fiction where it's like, oh, we're, we need to get gas. Gas is at a shortage. We can't get... Fucking, if you drop the population to 29 million, gas is everywhere. Gas is not a problem. Well, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of problems with science fiction. I, I, have, I have such a hard time wrapping my brain around. I am a science fiction writer. I am creating my own world my own entire universe. I am creating all of the beings in it. I am creating their biology. I am creating their skin. I am creating how they live and breathe and their language. I am creating every minute detail of this world. Here's a bunch of white people. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? Fuck, come on. How is everyone still fucking beautiful fucking white people? It's science fiction. Beautiful you can make white. plaid people. Yes. Fucking not one Mexican in your whole fucking science fiction. It because pissed me off. Like yeah. It pisses me off. This movie, this, this movie is, it's been so long since I've seen a film that is this less of a film. This is almost yeah. not a movie. Yeah. There's so little to this. It's not a film. It's so hard to yeah. It's so hard to talk about this cuz it barely exists. So, you know, Big Sexy's son who I kept thinking of X Pac anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Decides he is going to go and kill all the homeless people who are all at the school, which would technically be a home. Yeah. It's indoors. They all live in there. It's a home. Let's go kill all the homeless people at the home they live in. And then and then our hero, who I kept having a really hard time taking seriously for many reasons. But in particular, he kept reminding me of that comic whose name I can't remember, who was an ex-Marine who was in the Jump Street movies. He's the host of Holy Moly. Is he? Yes. Rob Riggle! Kept reminding me of that guy. They look really similar. And, and I... And I also saw him with his shirt off. So those are two reasons I really, really couldn't take him seriously. He... This movie is a prime example of... <laughs> Let's 
pay a named actor to be in our movie to film for one day so we can advertise him. Yes. So so we can so we can advertise Lockdown Survival of the Fittest starring WCW's Vinny Vegas. Yes. <laughs> This is, a, this is a painfully cheap-ass, low-budget film. In fact, it's so low-budget. If you are listening to this and you haven't seen this film, there is literally an afterwards, some text after the movie and before the end credits that explains, this movie was made by a tiny cast and crew. We know this is cheap as shit, but please be nice. I'm like, yeah. I've seen a couple of Neil Breen movies at this point. None of them have apologies in the credits. Yes. Jesus, this movie. So it's loosely about COVID, but it's mostly about an active shooter situation in a school. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. That's about it. So our yep. hero, for some reason, decides to go and save her, his crackhead sister. Which, come on, man, get with the times. It's all meth now. You go with meth, or you go with fentanyl, crack. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good going, boomer. <laughs> man, it, as as long as as long as she's not on that angel dust. Yes, right? Bowser hated the angel dust. And what has he had? (laughs) It's like, I understand that, like, okay, this is a low-budget indie film that was made on a shoestring budget by a group of people during the lockdown. I understand that, and I see the afterword that they wrote asking for people to be nice and thanking all the people who worked hard and how this is a labor of love, but a bad movie is a bad movie regardless of budget. Yeah. You know? You this were is li- just bad. You were literally writing the script while you were filming the movie and it fucking shows. Fucking Money Plane was a better script than this. Yeah. The, the big thing the big thing that I kept noticing is that like they kept having these reactions to different things that had happened to them. Like how mean her parents were to her or something along that line. And they would never tell us what it is the fuck that happened. Mm-hmm. Like, don't actually give us the background story? Yeah. So I'm I guess just, you're saving that for the prequel. Yeah, so I'm just... And it was like it through the whole thing. Like, they didn't, they didn't want to actually tell you what was going on at any point in this movie. Like, Because, yeah. yes, and that's exactly it. They didn't know... So there's just nothing there. Yeah. This movie barely exists. This movie is barely a movie. It's like, well, should, what should I what should I do in this scene? Like I don't know, cry and get all angsty over something. Yeah. This movie was written, produced and directed by a guy named Micah Lyons. And this is true. His IMDb trivia states that he proposed to his wife after just six weeks and six days of dating, which I find fascinating because what that means is that um, this week's movie is not his only bad decision. (laughs) Just say it. Yes. So in this movie, Kevin Nash, WCW's Oz, plays a vengeful Confederate loving Santa Claus 
And his evil plan is to set 90% of a film in a high school. Bunny. And then it's like, okay, Bonnie, why don't you explain the plot of the film? The plot of the film is like one sentence. I think we got it. Yeah. Like. This film doesn't exist. I was expecting this to be like like an elite team of yeah secret agents that had to know this movie's bare- Kevin Nash is barely in this goddamn movie. Let's talk about Kevin Nash. Let's talk about Kevin Nash. Okay, Kevin Nash. Four scenes. Four scenes in, total. He was in Magic Mike. He was in Magic Mike XXL. He was in two Adam Sandler movies. He was a bad guy in a pre-MCU Marvel movie. He was he was in the first John Wick movie for fuck's sake. And his best performance ever, Rock of Ages. Tom Cruise's bodyguard in Rock of Ages. The man has had a career. How do you do those big movies? And you also are in Slaw. Yes. Remember Slaw? Yes. A masterpiece compared to this. Yes. And that movie sucks. Oh, my God. I, I don't remember what episode Slaw was, but I know that it was ridiculously early in the pandemic. I think yes. we had already started the summer of Saw when we saw Slaw. That was difficult to say. I, I was actually still working in a facility. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So so we might uh, not have quite ha- have hit the actual pandemic yet. Yeah, so this is a real classy film. There's a fart joke three minutes into the movie. That's a sign of quality. And you said that the star uh, looked like X-Pac? No, the son of Kevin Nash the, looked the like son. X-Pac. The star no, looked... Not terribly, but he reminded me yeah. of X-Pac anyway. Yeah. The star of the movie looks exactly like the director tried to buy Ben Affleck on Wish. <laughs> yes. Okay. And this is what he got. I would also like to take this time to say that when Kevin Nash wrestled as Big Daddy Cool Diesel in the WWF and he was champion during his reign as a WWF champion in the mid 90s, the live event numbers were the all time worst drawing numbers in WWE history. So it makes a sort of sense to now see. Big Daddy Cool Diesel, the the who had the lowest draw numbers in the history of uh, the WWE, now starring in uh, Lockdown Survival of the Fittest. Yes, it makes a sort of sense. Uh, it, to be clear, Kevin Nash booked WCW, and that's why he always won. He was always the cool guy. He ended Goldberg's streak. The NWO always won. They never got their comeuppance. And as far as I'm concerned, Kevin Nash and Vince Russo killed WCW. Uh, That's why you don't let your star book all of the matches. There's (laughs) also the fact that... uh, We're looking at you, Triple H. (laughs) Hulk Hogan also had in his contract that he had creative control over everything that his character did. Those two things. And uh, Kevin Nash is booking uh Hulk Hogan's uh, uh creative clause and Vince Russo being Vince Russo killed WCW. Uh and surprisingly enough Vince Russo follows me on Twitter which is fucking weird but uh, <laughs> but but that's fine. Uh so just want to be clear fuck Kevin Nash. Uh yes. That being said, I still think the theme song to NWO Wolfpack was the shit, but that's beside the point. <laughs> he said some horrible things about Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. That I never forgave him for. He once said on some fucking podcast that, like, uh, 
when Chris Benoit held, uh, hugged Eddie Guerrero in the ring at WrestleMania is when professional wrestling died. Because you have these two men and they're carrying the belts and they're carrying the sport and they're not even bigger than the referee. Okay, fuck you. <laughs> you got that old timey Vince McMahon uh, mentality of professional wrestling where it's like, okay, uh, you can't be champion because you're under six foot. Yeah. Oh, you want to be champion? How much do you weigh? Oh, sorry. You don't weigh enough. Like fucking Daniel Bryan was like 150 pounds wet. <laughs> People fucking loved him and they still do, but. <sighs> so anyway, this movie sucks. Don't watch <laughs> it. Don't watch it ever. You're not so going to miss anything. Whoop. 10 minute warning. Okay. I thought it was an action movie, but there's no action. I thought it was a drama. Nothing in it's dramatic. It's set in the future, but there's nothing futuristic about it. COVID kills most of humanity, but Big Daddy Cool Diesel is driving a brand new truck. It's an hour and 20 minutes, but there's 10 yes. minutes of plot. And you can still get your mail delivered. You can still get your mail delivered. And... They, the they, thing they got the that thing they is, got the letter at the end saying it's yeah. over. They found the cure. Yeah. So that's the thing is that all of these COVID exploitation films that we're doing this summer, uh, they all share a very similar situation. Cheap shit rushed into production to make a quick buck off of a deadly disease. You want to know how bad all of these COVID exploitation movies are? Let me tell you. So far, the best film has been 2025. Yeah. The World Enslaved by a Virus by German Predator Joshua Wesley. That's how bad these movies are. Yes. <laughs> We're looking at this Christian anti corona movie and saying, well, I had the most fun in this one. Like, that's how bad these movies are. Yeah. They are bad. Sure, 2025, The World Enslaved by a Virus was like some weird far-right Christian shit, but at least it was fun, funny shit. This week's movie yeah. is just crap. And by re by when you read the afterword at the end of the movie before the credits, you can even tell that the filmmaker knew it was crap. You don't put that afterwards if you made a movie you're super proud of. Yes. You put that in your movie as a way of saying, please be nice to me. Please. I tried my hardest. I did my best. So, yeah. It, it, according to IMDb, this film had a three million dollar plot. Two point five million of that definitely was to get Vinny Vegas of NWO Wolfpack to do half a day's work, and the the other five hundred thousand went to actually making a film where ninety five percent of it is in an empty school. Uh, I this movie was hard. This movie was hard, and we've watched some pretty shitty films. Yes. Last week's movie all took place in an elevator. The week before that, that movie hardly existed because they just got some Italian horror movie and redubbed it. Yes. To be about some sort of food recipe or something? I don't remember. <laughs> um, Fake Crying the Movie by Mitesh Patel was horrible. Yes. That yes. was the Tucson movie. And then 2025, The World Enslaved by a Virus was horrible. But, oh, man, so far, I got to say, this has been the absolute worst. Uh, Yeah, and, and it's tough. It's tough to beat a summer of the worst movies, which we've already yeah. done. But somehow, yeah. this is doing it. Yeah, yeah. Like, if I had to choose between COVID-19 lockdown and the legend of Chun-Li, I'd be like, uh, Like, how much, how much time do I have to think it over? 
<laughs> Not much. Yeah. I mean, but, uh, a lot of the movies on the worst list, at least when we started out, weren't particularly bad. They were just boring. They, they were, were just, just nothing. Dumb. Yeah. There's a reason Madonna isn't starring in films anymore. Yes. And please, please stop asking her. Can we get a United Nations ruling on this? Because I'm thinking her acting is just a crime against humanity. So, um, so that's it for our movie this week. Next week, we are continuing our summer-long deep dive into covid exploitation films with a 2021 horror movie called The COVID Killer. Let me tell you the plot of it. Uh, it's Andrew Cuomo's New York, okay. and there's a mask mandate. Everyone has to wear a mask. Oh, you know what this is good for? Serial killing! Because you can't see the murderer's face. So a serial killer starts killing people during the mask mandate and getting away with it because, oh, where's the killer? I don't know. He was wearing a mask. Everybody's wearing a mask. It's a COVID slasher. And it sounds great. But I think it has even less of a budget as this week's film. So I don't, I want it to be good. But it looks about the same level of crap as uh, Lockdown Survival of the Fittest. Yes. So, and then originally, I believed that the, the biggest movie would be this week's movie, COVID 19 Invasion, starring Kevin Nash. That is until I learned of the existence of the film Songbird. Starring um, Demi Moore, All right. Bradley Whitford, and Archie from Riverdale. So that is now going to be our big finisher because this is a big budget Hollywood film with actual famous actors set in a future where COVID-19 is like COVID-25 or something like that. And all of the people who have COVID are in these like camps and the lockdown has been going on for years. And so... It, that is going to be our, our 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 big finisher this summer. Okay. Can one of these COVID films actually be good? That is the question that we are going to ask. Because 2025, The World Enslaved by a Virus was shit, but at least it was laughable shit that I would gladly watch a couple of other times. On yes. account of it was so bad, there really is sort of a birdemic the uh, Neil Breen quality to 2025, the world enslaved by a virus. But all of these other ones, I wouldn't touch again. With well, his fucking Braveheart speech alone. <laughs> yeah. They'll never oh, take man. out freedom. Yeah. To a crowd of three. To a crowd of three. Oh, man, you need to track down 2025, the world enslaved by a virus. The man who the man who made the film. Uh, I'm not saying he's a sexual predator. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah, some yes, other people. <laughs> maybe some other people are saying that. We definitely aren't. We're more of a classy show. So, um, so next week we're doing the film The COVID Killer. It sounds great, but I I don't know if it's going to be any good. Any better yeah. than this, to be to be honest with you. But now that I'm looking back at this week, oh man, NWO Wolfpack, Dave Van Ronk, Cost Plus Drug Company, a website owned by Mark Cuban that can help you get lower prescriptions, Howie Mandel's prolapsed anus TikTok. That's an actual thing. You can Google it. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> man i gotta say i think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast this has been a damn good episode yes i agree but i didn't want to step on your toes i feel you make that distinction and not me and and i didn't want to impose but yes i concur 
with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Maylin. And on behalf of Natasha and Jaden and Eleanor and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. Okay, do Mao's line for them. And you, and you do flush shows and poopy tits. Okay, and now do your line. And you, and you pop tarts. And you pop tarts, nice, Eleanor. And you, and you crackers. And what? Wow, Eleanor, getting racial. <laughs> Jaden, do you want a final word? Yeah. Off in a sec. Hurry up. Two tarts. And you two tarts don't know.